There is no doubt the world is facing daunting challenges these days. Look around. We have reached a critical point in human history. Old leadership models, beliefs, and behaviors are no longer working. Centuries of emasculation have brought us to the brink. Men need help, and who better to help us but the women? This is well, the Women's Expressions on Leadership, Learning, and Liberty podcast show, and I'm its host, John Crotet. My guests are accomplished and intelligent women who share not only their personal stories, but give us valuable insights and perspectives on the leadership challenges men face. In a world still dominated primarily by men, these honest perspectives can be a genuine catalyst for male leadership improvement. By exploring possibilities and opportunities for self-improvement and transformation, we offer men hope in an ever-changing, fast-paced, complex world. Thank you for listening and for your support. Lead on. I'm super excited for this episode of Well. It's taken us a while for Davidica and me to get here. A lot of things have come up and we know how chaotic things can be. And they're dealing with a family issue that's very close to her heart. So completely understand. But anyhow, she's here and we're grateful. On this episode, who we have is Davidica Little Spotted Horse, who lives right on the Pine Ridge Reservation up in the Dakotas. And she's got an interesting story to tell. And she's got some great wisdom that can help us. I'm going to start out with a few things about her. And then in, I'm going to read you something in her own words. And then we'll just get started because you're not here to listen to me. You want to hear her story. So Davidica is a singer songwriter. And like I said, she's from the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota. She describes her lyrics in three words, heartfelt, personal, and passionate. Her songs are about love. We know we need more of that. Loss. And we've had a lot of loss. Hope and happiness. And she believes that all humans deal with these same feelings. And I, I agree with her 110%. Davidica's songs are about her own life. She's going to tell us later on how we can go somewhere to listen to them. However, she did co-write two songs with her brother about his struggles. And in their co-written song, Aaron's Song, it was written for his best friend, Aaron Lakota. And it's a gift for being such an important part of their family and to voice what he was going through at the time that the song was written. Now, in her own words, in Davidica's own words, here we go before we get started. I am a singer, songwriter first, and foremost, I just happen to be native, but more than anything, I am a human being. So I humbly give all of my songs to humanity, no matter what your race, because we can all relate to the human condition, life. I've always had a dream I would leave something behind to mark, to make my mark in history for my future descendants. My music is my gift to them. My children are my biggest supporters. I cherish my children, my extended family, and my friends every day. Pila Mia. That's her native language of Lakota, which means thank you. And I thank you, Davidica, for being here today. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's good to be here. Yes, you know, it is good to be here. And, and so well, let's just get started. You know, we, we, we have busy days going on, and I know you've got things that you need to do today as well. But, you know, tell us a little bit about you and your family growing up on the reservation. What was that like? Um, actually, so I was born and um, raised here until I was six. And then from six until 17, I was actually in Colorado. And uh, my father and my mother raised me traditional. And when I was in um, Colorado, I ended up being put into the foster system for six years. 
And my mom fought and got all of her children back. And then when we, uh, when in my teenage years, I was actually a pretty bad teen. I was a juvenile delinquent and got in a lot of trouble. Um, it had nothing to do with like drinking or drugs or anything like that, but definitely getting into trouble and ended up being in prison for a year. And, you know, while I was there, the only thing I remember promising is when I got out, I would never go back and I would never make those mistakes again. And so when we got out, my mom did take me to ceremony and then we moved back to the res when I was 17. We came back here and I'm 49 now and we've been here ever since. So live the rest, you know, after my teenage years here. And, you know, being born here already still had a presence when I came back. Everybody remembered me. And, and we always came back since I was like 12 every summer for Sundance and for ceremony because this is where we have ceremony. So this is where we come to. And I, you know, I had a little bit of a different experience because my family is traditional. And being in a traditional family, it's a little more supportive. And the family members... We're, we take care of each other, so there's a lot of, I don't know how you would say that, but like, by like, families, connected to families, and even where we live, and um, where we hang out, and um, the ceremonies we do together, our daily life is intertwined with each other, so all of our extended families, we all just take care of each other, and, and help each other in the community also. You know, I'm glad you, you're back and I'm glad you made those important decisions to never go back. You know, I think we've got some similar traits. You know, I'm not going to go there, but uh, I was kind of a hellraiser, too, and not sure what that was all about. But I had my brushes with the law as well. Um, tell me what the traditional means to you and the family and and. And a little bit about the ceremony, because a lot of people that might listen to the show might not understand Lakota uh, traditions okay. and ceremony. Tell us a little bit about that, Dedica. Well, in, in when I say traditional, I mean in Lakota, according to Lakota spirituality. And in Lakota way, our spirituality is intertwined with all of our life. We live our life in such a way where we follow our um, traditional values and with, you know, our four main values are respect, wisdom, courage, and generosity. But like the true meaning of those things, mm -hmm. uh, you know, not, not the, I guess, non-native meaning of those things, you know, true respect, giving people respect always, not they don't have to earn it. You're just given them, you give it to them, unless they give you a reason not to respect them. So, and, and the true meaning of generosity, which is to give without wanting anything back or expecting anything back. You just give. And, and wisdom, wisdom knowing that you don't know everything, but you're going to learn. You know, you're going to, to gather that knowledge, gather those, that information. And then, of course, ge uh, um, um, wisdom, courage, generosity, and courage. And courage is to be able to do what you need to do do the right things no matter what because you know it takes courage even to admit when you're wrong so courage is a huge huge thing not to be um confused with bravery you know bravery is uh, doing things to fight fear and courage is doing things even in the presence of fear doing the right thing anyway so those four main values they say in lakota way if you use those values and and go back to them with any decision you make small to large then you're always living your life in a good way so being traditional is adhering to our traditional um philosophies our traditional teachings and our spirituality and I, like i said it, it's very different where where our spirituality in in lakota way we intertwine it in everything and it's it's um a part of everything even our our education even our our political system, everything, our spirituality is part of all of it. We don't separate it. And because we believe that our spirituality gives us the strength and the knowledge, and like I said, and the courage and the wisdom to make good decisions in every part of our life. So being traditional is a mentality. And um, a lot of people confuse 
tr- being traditional with with culture, our spirituality with culture, um, just because you wear feathers or dress in in buckskin or regalia or you know walk around with your hair long that doesn't make you traditional traditional is a mentality and a way of being and a state of being so my family we are traditional um myself i've never been exposed to like christianity or those kind of teachings and my generation thankfully is the first generation that was not forced assimilation not forced religion or forced boarding school or anything like that because of my my father who is in aim and my my mother and the family who's traditional fighting for those traditional rights so i'm well, really no, proud that i'm glad you described it that way because it is an education and you know what what i get gather is that it becomes part of your your whole your your whole core value set and and mm-hmm. and your foundation of yourself as a being and mm-hmm. you know we all know that when something's forced upon you that is not necessarily part or, or it has more difficulty seeping in, I think. And I think that when cultures or people that happen throughout the centuries are forced to do things, it almost takes their spirit away. And, and not even almost, it takes their spirit away. You know, we were talking earlier and uh, I had the fortunate, I was fortunate to be in a ceremony, the sweat lodge, um, with a Lakota warrior who served the United States of America as a fighter pilot in Vietnam. And he was traditional from the way you describe it. And now, and I wish he was still with us, he's gone. But now I understand even more 15 years later, what he was trying to tell me and tell us who were in the sweat lodge. So, you know, you mentioned a Sundance and I know that, you know, I've heard a lot about it. I've never been to one. Can you, Davidica, can you describe what the Sundance is and, and why it's practiced? Um, the Sundance is our, our most sacred ceremony. Uh, we have seven sacred ceremonies in our tradition, and it's the most sacred. Uh, it's uh, a time where we spend four days fasting and dancing and singing and being in a complete state of prayer for four days. The Sun Dancer will be um, with the Sun Dance family in from morning, from sun, sunrise to sunset, they'll be dancing. And it's hard for people to understand when they're not traditional or they're not, not, not I don't know how to say it, but not Lakota. They're like, they think it's an endurance test or a physicality. And it's really not. It's not. You're when you're in in the arbor, when you're in the, at the sun dance and in the arbor, in that circle, you're in a complete state of prayer. And prayer for everybody, prayer for every single thing on this planet. And and I think this is why when we're taught about the sun dance, they tell you when you're in the sun dance, you know, it's the sun dancers that that keep our our, our balance in this universe, in this, this, I don't know how you would say state of being as human beings, the sun dancers make those sacrifices for us so that we will live. So we will continue as a people so that we continue as a race. And I'm not talking about just natives, but as human beings, they go in there and they sacrifice those four days, um, fasting and dancing and praying and uh, almost being, and I, I don't want to go into every single detail, but being in a different state of, of being, a, a different presence on, on this earth, because they're in the sacred space that we've made for them. And so that that's what they talk about, especially in the in some of the Sundance songs, they'll say, you know, I'm I suffer for my people so that they will live. So that is our, our most sacred ceremony. Well, you know, thank you and for not that. Not everybody is a sun dancer, by the way. I know a lot of times too, people are like, oh, I want to dance. I want to dance because they think of it as an endurance test or I don't know what, exactly what they think of it, but it's not, you know, to Sundance, even back in, in the old days before Europeans came here, we used to only have one Sundance a year and it was at Peshla and all of the Ocheti Shakui, which means all the bands, because we have seven bands in of Lakota and Dakota and Lakota, all of our people would come together in one spot in the Black Hills and have one Sundance a year 
because not everybody sun dances. You have to be called to it, and there has to be a reason to sun dance because you have to live your way, your life in a sacred way. When you're sun dancing, you have to live your life differently than you would when you mm -hmm. weren't sun dancing. There's so many different, like I guess, stipulations, kind of, or um, a, a, a protocols. I guess not stipulation, but protocols. Once you're a sun dancer, you can't be in an angry state or a negative state, you're not allowed to be hitting anyone or fighting or arguing. Like you have to be in a complete state of a, of um positive being. And while you're, you know, a lot of times sun dancers will do a commitment of four years is actually the minimum. So you make a commitment of four years. So for those four years, you have to be in this different state of being um, in, in a sacred state of being. And so it's a big commitment. It's huge. So not everybody sun dances, but the ones who do, we're super grateful for. I appreciate your description because, you know, what I think is that it, it, it's a direct, you said sacred way of being. It, it, it's a spiritual connection to something greater than ourselves. And, and you know, we look around the world today and we can say, I know we can agree that there's there's a great uh, the, the spirituality and a connection to, and you mentioned all peoples. Uh, is missing on so many different levels. You know, we've, you know, for whatever reason, I personally think that greed is, is like, for whatever that it's not just money, but just being greedy in itself for money, land, whatever uh, we're greedy for is not a good thing for any of us. Um, and I uh, appreciate your description. You know, so we, we, so we talk about anger and we talk about loss of spirit. And the reason why we did this show to begin with is to is to help men to be better men. You know, when you were a younger person and, and rebellious or whatever you were doing, or even with your family, what did you learn about boys? What what was your vision or perception of boys and men in general as as a young woman, young girl? Well, I think because I was raised traditional, we have a little bit of a different outlook on on men and boys. Um, when we're young, they don't, we have, I don't know, it's hard to explain that like when we're, when we're young as a traditional person, um, we're taught things that like the women should know this and the men should know this. We're already being taught that when we're young and, and because, because we're a generational thinking people, I don't know if you understand that, but we think generations ahead when we have our children, we're thinking of our grandchildren. So we're raising our children to be good parents, to be good grandmothers, and to be good people. So once they're good people, they're good parents, because we're thinking of continuing our line, our lineage. So when I was young, I know that my the men in my life, especially uh, my uncles and, and my, my cousins, they were amazing people. So I had really good male role models in my life and my father died when I was um 16 and my mother and him uh, divorced when I was young but he I stayed with him until I was six and the mm. family took care of me in a traditional way because we, we believe that uh until a child is around six or seven that's when the most important teachings are taught to a child and my mother was going to college in, in Boulder so my dad asked to keep me until then, so they could instill the traditional values and morals, um, stories, those kind of teachings. And then, then he would let her um, have me or keep me or whatever. And so that's what happened. So he did keep me then. And my mom's family here on the reservation, my dad's family here on the reservation, um, made sure that I you know, knew about my language. I spoke my language and um, the songs and my ceremonies. And, and I was really young, but I still learned all those teachings and about courage and um, even how to stand up for myself. I was super young, but my dad was a Vietnam vet, by the way, and mm. he did two tours. And so he made sure that I knew how to even fight. <laughs> so it, it was, you know, it, it was different for me because I had a lot of positive male role models. My father is very protective of me. He was not mean to me. My grandpas adored me and to me, I, I, I do believe that there is a difference between someone who was raised to be told they couldn't do things and someone who was raised to be told they could do anything. 
And honestly, the men in my life, especially, like I said, my father's, my grandpa's, my mom's father, um, my um, my grandpa John around him, who's a medicine man, um, who was one of my mentors. I have a lot of male mentors and they were super supportive and they always, always told me I could do anything. You're going to, you know, you're going to be a good leader. You're going to be a, a good woman. Um, you're, you know, you're a great mother. Like they always, always took care of me if I needed anything you know, they would show up and bring me things if I needed, even something as simple as groceries. Do you have groceries, my girl? Do you have this? Do you have that? And, you know, gifting me horses, making sure I learned how to ride a horse by the time I was three. So I had a lot of really good males in my life. That's awesome. You know, and for the guys that are listening, you know, the Vitica story right there is a huge freaking example of, of, of you know, you might call it a sacrifice, fellas, but it, it, it's really what we need to do. We need to be mentors. We need to step up. We need to have the courage. And like she had said earlier, it's not about bravery and proving ourselves. We can always pull out the weapon, but it takes a bigger person to, to be responsible. And the men, we need to do this. And uh, Davidica's explanation tells us why. You know, tell us a little bit about your, your musical journey. And a little bit about your songs and how you got in. You mentioned that you listen to traditional songs, but you sing some rock and roll and some folk, don't you? Yeah, yeah. Well, oh, I don't know about folk, but yeah, definitely, <laughs> um, definitely, um, rock in in and rock ballads. Oddly, um, my father is a singer, but he's a traditional singer and sings ceremony and powwow songs. My mother's a singer. Um, my grandfathers, I think almost everyone in my family sings traditional or powwow. But when I was living with my mom, I was in the second grade and I had the tried out for the choir in the second grade. Mm -hmm. And I won the the part of the little drummer boy. <laughs> that was my that's, first time. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> I was a little drummer boy. First time on stage. And my hair was actually like past my butt. Like, wow. Uh, yeah and so my mom had to like make a big bun and put this hat on me yeah so I, I wouldn't look like a girl on stage but um and after that and I remember feeling amazing being able to sing on stage and I was only in the second grade so after that I always tried out for choir um and then got into about fifth or sixth grade and because I have a really good falsetto and I'm a soprano so they ended up putting me in um, our, one of the teachers, one of my singing choir teachers asked me if I wanted to study operetta. And I didn't understand what operetta was. And it's not like opera. It's a little bit not as super strict, um, but it's still singing classical music and still doing kind of musical stuff. So I said, yes. And I started training that, training in operetta all the way until um, I graduated high school. So that was my training. And then um, I got pregnant at a really young age. I was 18 when I had my daughter, my first, mm -hmm. my eldest daughter. And at that time, I decided that I wasn't going to do anything but raise my children just raise my kids and I let go of everything because I'm also an artist, by the way. So I had a scholarship for art for the American Union Art Institute. And I let that go too, because I just wanted to focus on being a mother. Mm -hmm. So I did. But during that time of being a mother, uh, my kids were maybe 12, 11 years old. Their father was in a band. Uh, my ex-husband, he was in a band. And I always, always played instruments also, but I always played bass instruments, you know, like baritones and the trumpet. And, I mean, not bass, but brass instruments. So one day his his, his uh, bass player didn't show up for practice. And so they were like, oh, Davidica, you could come over here and play these few chords so we can practice. And I was like, sure. So I played a few chords and I was like maybe 25, 26 and so I said, all right, that's fine. And so off and on for a few years, I would just jump in practice with them. But during those years, I realized I loved playing the bass. Like I really loved it. And But nobody would teach me because I was also, there was no females at that time on this reservation doing music at all. Mm. Like 
contemporary music. They were doing power music for sure. But nobody wanted to teach me. Uh, and so my ex-husband bought me a bass and he bought me a book and I taught myself and just, and it was weird because I'm, I'm, I don't know how to explain it, but I, um, I just don't like being told what to do. Honestly, that's the end. That's, <laughs> the, that's the, at the end of the day, that's what it is. So I didn't want to do exactly how the book said. So I just learned where to place my fingers and I just did however I thought sounded good. And I would just mess around with the bass. And then I just uh, started writing music. Uh, it was the death of somebody and learning her story. And uh, then I wrote the song, Her Story, from from that. And I wrote her song, her, I put her song, her, uh, her life to a song. And that was my very first song I ever wrote. Good for you. You know, you, you the way you described it, it's a combination of, you know, desire, spiritual spirituality and a heart and then it's like this mixture and you're creating you're creating music to leave and you said as a legacy you know uh, so writing songs is this process and the songs are about life like you mentioned and then you co-wrote with your brother tell us about a couple of songs that you co-wrote and about your brother so the the song um Aaron's song we actually renamed to I Walk Among the Dead and my brother had brought me um, just the music, the music to, uh, he's like, I found this riff. I really like this riff because I've been teaching my brother how to play guitar and he's really good. So, and he was only like 14, 15 at the time. And he said, you know, and I, I want to write this, this song for, for Aaron. His best friend had found out he was uh, adopted and it was in a bad way that he had found out in, in a heartbreaking way. And the family he was adopted to had turned their back on him. Mm -hmm. And so he had nowhere to go. And he was so freaked out because they turned their back on him because he was drinking and he wouldn't stop and they didn't know what to do. So it was like a weird, a, a weird position to be in, but we let him move in with my, my mom and my brother. They were like, you can move in with us. Of course you can. You know, he grew up with my brother. He's his best friend. So uh, he told his story to my brother. And then my brother called me over and he told his story to me. And so my brother said, I wrote this riff and I want to uh, make sure that we write him a song so he knows he's not forgotten, that he knows he's important. And because that's what he felt like, like he didn't belong anywhere and he didn't you know, because his family didn't want him. And in Lakota way, our family is everything. So your family not wanting you is devastating. So we told him we're writing this song for you. And he was, and he, he and even today he shows people all the time, that's my song, that's my song. So it, it, it did what we wanted it to do and, and encouraged him that way. And so I wrote all the lyrics to the song and then put it together. And, and it's a, a really, um, even for me, really, it's super meaningful every time we, every time I sing it and people will come up to me and go, that's me. I'm Aaron. <laughs> that's who I am. And how did you know? And I'm like, wow, this is amazing. Cause I didn't know so many people would, would be able to connect with it, but they do. And it is about um, his, his fight with alcohol. And it's about his fight with, with needing to belong and not understanding why, why he was um, pushed away. So it's, it's a great song. We're going to find out in a little while how we can go hear that song. But thank you for sharing that. You know, Davidic, it's nice to know. It's nice to know what's behind, you know, the things that people do. And it gives it so much more meaning. And maybe it's a lesson for all of us when we hear a song or when we meet a person and they're different, maybe from us, that we need to just um, we need to take a deep breath. And before we go uh, stereotyping or passing judgment, we need to really dig deep and slow down a bit and not be so condescending or, or arrogant or angry, you know, I, you know, attributes that nobody needs to do. You know, you mentioned that we're all going through the same things in life and, and I have to agree with you. And I, and I think that we're looking for these connections and what I like about, women and leaders like yourself that have and exhibit courage and overcome the hard things in the world. Uh, I know, and I'm smart enough, 
I'm a little bit older than you, but I'm smart enough to know that you have wisdom that I can use. What do you think? Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. And, and, and what do you think men can do from your perspective to be better men? Well, I know I can tell you from my traditional teachings that they talk about because the, the, the boys stay with the mom completely almost all the time with the mom until they're about six or seven. Also, the reason they do this is because the boys have to learn compassion and empathy and uh, like a different type of thinking, a different type of concern. So we as women, they tell us in Lakota way, women, we are innately given that because we have the power to create life. Because we have the power to create life and because we're that uh, vessel that that life comes from, Tongashla has already implanted path, empathy, compassion, uh, nurturing, all those things innately in us. Mm-hmm. And that's that is why we we are the way we are as women but because the men they were created and they can't create life it doesn't make them less than it just means that they have to do things to be in balance with us so traditionally the anipi we never went to we weren't women never went into anipi because the anipi is a a cleansing ceremony and a uh, like re-energizing rebalancing it's a ceremony for that. And we as women, we have our moon every month. And so we go through this, this pain every month. We live this in our life all the time. This pain brings us humility and humbleness and pushing through, you know, what we go through when we have our moon time. And I don't know if you know what moon time is, but it's our, it's our, uh, how you say it, period. I don't know. Yeah, Yeah, the menstrual menstrual cycle. Yeah, menstrual cycle. So we as women, we naturally go through that uh, our almost our whole lives. We have to push through pain. We have to understand um, emotional turmoil. We go through all kinds of things that the Mm -hmm. men don't go through once a month. It's not mandatory for them almost. So Tongashla, our 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 creator gave us these uh, ceremonies for the men. It's even Sundance was not for the women. Sundance was only for the men because the men had to go through this type of, because when you're in an EP, you know, it's super hot and it's uncomfortable. So you have to let go of your physical um, pain and physical struggles to focus on prayer only. The same way that women do. We go and take care of our family, take care of our our home and everything, even though we're in pain and we're having a a miserable, physically miserable time, we're still pushing through. And that gives us a different state of being, right? So they, to balance the men out with us, they gave the the men the anipi so they could, you know, and we, we didn't anipi once a week back in the day. It was maybe two, three times a year, but it gave the men that perspective so they could be in balance with us so we both had a, the same experience and we're in balance so when we talk about raising our boys we talk about we're raising our boys to treat our daughters treat the women the way they should be treated and to be strong and courageous but definitely having to to give them love and 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 being um gentle with them and teaching them what it means to to actually have unconditional love and most men because they're raised in this masculine misogynistic world Mm -hmm. don't get that they don't get the the years of ultimate unconditional love and compassion and gentleness and caring and you know i i've even heard a non-native person say we coddle our boys and i was like okay then that's fine. If you think that's something bad, that's your business. But we're proud. We're proud that we do take care of boys. My son was 21 before he served his own plate because he has all sisters because we do take care of our boys that way. But the balance is that we take really good care of our men and our boys because they grow up to protect us and provide for us. <clears throat> they grow up to lead us to be leaders because like also that way, 
when they when Europeans came and stripped our our family of our men and brutalized them and put them in boarding schools, they took away their place in society. And that's when women started sun dancing. That's when women started going to a nipi because they had taken our men and broken them where they didn't have their culture anymore. They didn't have their spirituality. And so we still today pray that one day it'll go back to the way it was and we won't need to Sundance and women won't need to, to go to Anipi because our men will, will stand up and take their place in society and, and be that, that strong presence for us and be in balance with us women. So a lot of people who are, are like feminist or, or those, you know, those type of mentality, they don't like to hear that because they think it's something bad, but in Lakota way, we don't, we don't think it's bad that, that the main positions in our community are supposed to be men because it's a balance because the women we're here to give them um, direction. You know, we're not beneath them or, or anything like that, but we're here. We just have a different place in our society. Also, we have a different role in our community also than the men have. So we are, like I said, we, we, my thought is it's up to us women to raise good men and people hate when I say that when they're like oh these men are so messed up I said well then what kind of moms raise them what kind of mothers raise these boys because that's it's the mother's job to to raise a good man and and people hate mm-hmm. to hear that but it's true because in Lakota way they say honestly if a child is not around their father too much it's okay but if a father is not around their mother then it's bad. A, a, a mother issues is way worse, honestly, than father issues because yeah. mothers give that connection, that deep, deep connection of empathy and, and that deep strength that, that men need to our boys need to be good men. So even with my own son and I only have one son and even with him, I made sure that we, we raised him traditional, made sure that he understood that he's so sacred made sure that he understood that he is so loved and, and cherished by me and his sisters and our family. And, and, and it's so, so crazy because as they grew older, you know, my son took his place where his sisters took care of him so well. And then as he got to be a man, he's taking care of his sisters and doing things for them that they need, you know, and, and being real respectful to them. And making sure that the men in their lives are respectful to them too. So, you know, it, it, it is that. It is, I believe, at the root of everything is how we raise our, our sons. And a lot of men who don't get that, they don't know that they can still change that as they become older. Well, I'm glad that, you, um, that you're the mother that you are and the person that you are. And, you know, you've clarified some things for me. Uh, I love that hope of a world where things are in balance. And what I love about the things that you just described today is that you're thinking about the future, you know, that your, your, your concepts and your perspective are not nearsighted. And so thank you for that. Um, I love the mutual respect that you describe between the sexes and uh, the sexes between each other. I love the uh, spiritual core values and living them and actually not just offering <coughs> lip service, but they become part of who you are and as a being. And, and again, it, it, it makes us realize that we need to just stop every now and then and take it all in and, and, and maybe look at life in a different way from a different perspective. So, couple more things davidica how can you how can people that are listening go find your music oh on reverb nation so if you just type in reverb nation and davidica it will pop up so there you go reverb nation you can hear davidica's songs on 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 that website um i'm gonna ask you oh go ahead oh i was just gonna say you know a lot of times when because i you know, with my own brothers, because they didn't have a, a strong male in their life, my brothers. It's funny that I did because we have different fathers. So my my grandpas and uncles and 
cousins are not the same as theirs because like I said, because we have different fathers and they're from a different tribe also. So it was a little different, but like with cultural things, like I taught my brothers how to dance, powwow dancing, which is a min style, but I taught them how to dance traditional min style or gra- I taught my ex-husband how to grass dance. Um, I taught my brothers how to hunt and how to, uh, to uh, shoot guns, how to ride, to ride horses. And traditionally, I hold a role that is, is held by a man normally. Um, I'm the head of our Tokala society. It's a warrior society for my family, for my Teoshwe. And normally, traditionally, it's, it's held by a man. Uh, but I was trained by my uncles and my my uh, grandpas, my cousins, to be a Tokala. Because women are Tokalas also. We're also in a warrior society. We're just usually not the head of the society. So I always talk to people and say, I know one day I'm waiting for the young man to come to take my place. And so that way I can focus on other things. So at this time, you know, trying to make sure that we're raising the young men to be strong warriors so that way I can give up my position to to a strong warrior and uh, a lot of people don't understand that but I believe in this day in this day and age that the biggest uh, how would you say obstacle for us as human beings is that non-traditional thinking teaches separatism separatism of everything separatism of the sexes separatism of sexual preference like of, of, of gender it's just like so much separatism where in traditional way we focus more on on the care a person's character than any of all this other stuff and so we don't preach separatism we, we we don't teach that we try to teach unity and togetherness and why we should be depending on each other and why we should be there for each other and i think that's the biggest thing is trying to to get our mentality away from that that we shouldn't be fighting with the opposite sex it's not a fight nobody's better than each other we should be trying to be in balance with each other and try to encourage and support each other because once the men are strong the women are strong too and once the women are strong the men are uplifted and and we do need that we do need that because there's like you said when i go anywhere like because i'm an activist also it breaks my heart to show up and see that it's usually about 80% women and just a handful of men. And it makes me feel sad because I do realize that, that the men are forgotten and that we do as a, as a nation need to, to continue to use all of our resources and all of our strength and all of our spirituality and to, to, to lift the men back up so that we can be in balance. You know, the bit of guy, I love what you say, you know, when the men are stronger, the women are stronger. And, uh, you know, I was going to ask you, you know, did you have a, a special mantra or a special axiom or a saying? And I would think that that would be it. And, and you know, your leadership is unquestioned and your courage is unquestioned. And, you know, the story that you told us today and the, the lessons to be learned and the things to think about. Uh, are relevant. And I think they're not just relevant today, but I think they're relevant in the future from here on out. You know, you've certainly given me a different perspective on a few things. And, and I thank you for that. Um, you know, our guest today on well has been the Vitica little spotted horse. She has had some phenomenal uh, advice and, and lessons that we can all learn from. And, and I just, I hope and I pray for the world that you described a few minutes earlier and, you know, if there's anything we can ever do, you know, other than to continue to tell the stories and to support our friends in the nations, um, that's what we do. And we're going to continue to do it. And uh, my heart goes out to your family. I know you're going through a personal thing now with your sister and uh, we just wish her the best. And, and I wish you the best. And I'm going to give you the final say, whatever you'd like to say. And by, by the way, please go to Reverb Nation and type in Davidica, D-A-V-I-D. I C A. And so you can hear that song about walking amongst the dead, among the dead, and then the other songs that Davidic has put out there. And final thoughts, Davidic, on where we need to go or anything you want to say. I just want to say to the men out there to to not lose uh faith 
and to gather your courage. Because at this time, especially in this time in history, um, we're always pushing women this, women that, women this, which I'm happy for. I love my sisters and I'm all for women empowerment. But I also, like I said, I completely believe in balance. And I believe that our men need to uh, believe in themselves and know that nothing is permanent. Nothing, not a state of being, not a, a state of poverty, not a state of ignorance, nothing. You know, nothing is permanent. And, and in our Lakota way, we say you're walking the red road, but if you fall off the road or you go stray, you can always come back. You can always come back. There's always a way to come back to where you need to be. There's always a way to make amends when something has happened that you didn't want to happen. There's always a way to pull yourself back out of things. And there's always definitely a way to uh, relearn and, and heal from old patterns. And I think that's the thing that a lot of men don't, don't realize. They think it's a weakness to restart, to, to uh, give in to that something has gone wrong and then gather your courage and start again. But I believe that all men can do that in, in uh, I, I'm also like real heartbroken that most men are, are products of trauma and products of things that have happened bad to them. And you can heal from that. You can definitely heal from that. You don't have to live in that state of being. And it's not a weakness to get help and heal from that because we do need you. To, we need you men to be strong for us women. Thank you, Davidica. And, and there you have it, men. It's never too late. Things don't last forever. And if you choose to turn things around, you have that power. Thank you. Thank you for listening to another episode of Well. Without you, we don't exist. There is no show. We hope the men who joined us today learned some valuable tips to improve and not be ashamed to use them. Be the change, men. Set the example. Keep going. And for the women leaders out there, keep creating and keep helping us men to become even better men, more effective leaders. Thank you. Until next time, stay safe, be well, and lead.